Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call, and today it's our Halloween episode. The topic, bats. Josh Sarfstein talks to Dr. Emily Gurley, an infectious disease epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins. They discuss why bats are so important to public health, what it's like to work with bats, and the difference between bats and hangups about bats. Let's listen. Dr. Emily Gurley, thank you so much for joining me for our special Halloween episode of Public Health On Call. Happy to be here. Love Halloween and love public health on call. So two of my favorite things. And our topic today um, is bats. And um, we want to ask you some questions about bats. Are you you prepared for that? Can't wait. Okay. So the first question is bats and public health. Um, Why are bats important for public health? Well, for some reason... Uh, reasons that are not entirely clear and that are an an active area of investigation. Many of the emerging zoonotic infections that pose a threat to public health have originated in bats. So, um, you know, humans infected with with bat viruses uh, isn't that rare. you know, we know that uh, somewhere along on, along the way, SARS coronavirus two uh, came from a bat. But even since the pandemic began, there are numerous examples of other uh, viruses uh, from uh, that have infected humans from bats. Um, you know, even in the past year, Ebola outbreaks; those those viruses come from bats. Nipah virus uh, infects humans in in Bangladesh and and India. Uh, Commonly, that comes from bats. So um, so they are they are hosts to a number of pathogens that for some reason uh, have this trick where they can infect other species, including us. Most most pathogens can't do that, but but many of their viruses can. And. Do you think it, the answer might turn out to be in something about the immune system or, or or cell receptors that, you know, there's some similarity between bats and humans that, that just means that the viruses that can get bats infected can cross the species barrier? It's a good question. We don't completely know the answer. So there is, uh, there are some hypotheses that bats, the bats' immune systems are different than ours because they, uh, because they have flight. <laughs> um, but there's something about their internal regulation that is different from ours, and so they are able to uh, tolerate viruses that are um, highly pathogenic and virulent in other mammals. Um, Another uh, hypothesis is that, well, historically, throughout their evolutionary history, they've lived quite distant from humans if they can. Um, These days they can't. Um, But just, uh, you know, over time, we haven't overlapped with them very much in space and time. So we haven't had a chance to share viruses and and sort of co-evolve the same way we have with other mammals. So so that's another hypothesis. But the the viruses that infect the, the bat, you know, viruses that infect humans are actually really good at infecting most mammals. So it's not just that they can infect humans, but you mentioned. Uh, receptors, binding receptors, and they, many of them target um, 
uh, cell binding receptors that are, are highly conserved across mammalian species. So they are, let's say they, that these viruses have excellent survival strategies. <laughs> they, can, they can adopt very quickly to other, to other hosts. Got it. So they may be essentially viral incubators in a way that for viruses that are quite successful outside the bat. Yeah. 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 Uh, they seem to be, <laughs> they seem to be pretty good at it. Now it's my understanding you've done some research directly with bats. I have, and I do. Yeah. So t- tell me what that's about. So the first time I ever really thought a lot about bats was in uh, 2004. So I was uh, a new epidemiologist. I was working at a place called the ICDDRB, which is a health and population research institute in Bangladesh. And I was asked to join a team that was investigating an outbreak of fatal encephalitis, uh, which we were pretty sure was Nipah virus. And uh, Nipah virus is a, is a virus that originates in bats, uh, infects humans, uh, and can, we now know it, we, it can be spread between people, but at the time we didn't know. And at the time we didn't know how humans were being infected. So one of our goals on the investigation was to understand where the bats were and how humans could possibly be coming into contact with bats or their secretions that could have a virus in it. Um, And I've been studying those bats ever since. Um, Those are uh, commonly known as flying foxes. So they look very different than the bats we have here in North America. Um, They have some of them wingspans of up to six feet. and, and their faces, in fact, do look very canine. Uh, they, they do look like little foxes. They're very cute social animals and they eat fruit. So they're important pollinators and very important to the ecology. But um, yeah, they carry, they carry some nasty viruses. So um, you used a word that most people don't use for bats, which is cute. And I'm just wondering yeah. what, what, what it was actually like to work. Did, I mean... By studying bats, you like near bats. Mm. I mean, like, like, did you touch bats? I hate to ask, but like, like, what is it like? What are bats like up close and personal? Sure. Okay. If you don't think bats can be cute, you should definitely Google like fruit bats or flying foxes eating fruit. There are rescue places that rescue these bats all over their you know host range. Uh, I think the site may be in Australia. But they are actually they are actually very cute. Um, so these these bats that we study uh, they're called Teropus medius. Uh, as the, that's the species name, um, and they are they are quite large. They roost in trees. So um, it, so a group of bats together is called a roost. Some bats roost in caves. These bats though roost in trees, um, and they. Their roost sizes can be in the thousands and in, you know, back when there were more forests and and, uh, less encroachment from humans into their habitat, likely tens of thousands uh, in a roost. Um, Some places in Bangladesh now, the roost sizes are even quite small, even one to 200 bats living together. And they're in the roost during the day, hanging upside down, as we know bats do. Um, and then in the evenings, they leave the roost and fly out. They can fly even up to 20 kilometers or so a night looking for food, foraging for fruits. Uh, and they come back. And when we study bats, what we're often trying to do are get by a lot. Well, we can study where the bats live, how many bats are living in a certain place, how long they've been there. Um, But really, we're also trying to get biological samples from those bats to see if they're shedding viruses at the time um, and uh, and what their nutritional status is. Because similar to humans um, and and some of our viruses, if they are 
uh, immunologically suppressed, we think that leads to greater viral shedding. So healthy bats uh, are less likely to, to be secreting these viruses in our best estimation. So we're studying the health of the bats as well as, as, as what they're secreting. So we collect, so for example, we can put, we put down tarps underneath the roost. When they come back in the e at night from foraging, they will often urinate and defecate on arrival. Um, and then we can collect the urine and feces off the tarps. We also set up big nets and catch the bats in a net bring the net down when we, when we catch a bat. And then you have to work very carefully to disentangle that bat. And then we, um, I think the team collects, I mean, on a good night, you may catch 10 bats, but then you, uh, um, we keep them in pillowcases. We collect urine from them. Um, we give them a little anesthetic so that we can collect some blood, uh, oral swab, you know, everybody now who's been tested at least once for COVID can sympathize. They're, they're getting a little, you know, oral swab taken, uh, urogenital swab. Um, and then when they um, when they're done collecting some samples from the bats, they give them some fruit juice and release them back to the roost. So um, so maybe once a month or so we go visit some of the roosts that we've been following. Gosh, some of them now for more than 15 years. Um, and uh, to, to really try to understand uh, the ecology of these bats and their viruses. Well, that's, that sounds like quite, quite an evening with bats, what you just described. And I have to say, while you were talking, I did look up flying fox bats eating fruit on the internet. And we might have to agree to disagree on just how cute they are, <laughs> because I think the, the upside down part is still a little bit hard for the... <laughs> Un, you know, unexperienced eye to totally appreciate the cuteness mm -hmm. about, but um, <laughs> but it sounds like um, let me ask it to you this way. I'm this happen. I'm struggling to ask the question, but no, let me just say um, it wasn't that hard for you to get into the swing of all these different things with bats, or or was it an acquired kind of experience for you? Okay, so I'm coming at it from the perspective of. Uh, public health. So if people are being infected with this really nasty virus, I want to know why. Mm. And part of knowing why is getting to know those bats. So sort of all in a day's work. And I, and, and I, you know, generally curious about the world and, and they're fascinating creatures. So, you know, what's not to like, I mean, I, I, I want to be clear that, um, you know, there are, our wildlife veterinarians on our team that are trained to do this, right? They have the specialization in this. I, so I work with those teams, but I, I am not the lead for the hands-on bat collection, although I have done some of it. Yeah. Fair enough. It's, it's extremely important. And I think you emphasize not just for the public health aspects, but bats are very important in our world generally. Is that fair to say? Vitally important. And, and bats, <laughs> when, um, when most people think of bats, <laughs> they think of bloodsuckers, right? There, there is one type of bat, <laughs> vampire bats, that do feed on the blood of livestock. Okay. That almost all bats uh, do not do that. Almost all bat species in the world are either eat insects or fruit and nectar. Um, bats are the second most diverse mammalian uh, uh, group. So rodents are more diverse, but bats are very diverse. So there is anywhere, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different bat species, uh, but most of them either eat fruit or insects. Who doesn't like insect control? I mean, it, it, that's a great service to us. Um, and that's what most uh, bats in the U.S. are. They're, they're insectivorous bats. Uh, Rhinolophus bats where, uh, that carry coronaviruses uh, and sarbicoviruses that, you know, where SARS coronavirus 2 likely originated are also insectivorous bats. So, so you basically have bats, they're pollinators, which is really important for for, uh, you know, agriculture. And it's also, they eat 
insects, which is really important. And so, you know, some people might hear about bats and think like, if they've got these viruses in them, why do we need them at all? But that's not the right way to think about it. Not at all. No, and particularly the fruit uh, bat uh, eaters and pollinators uh, are vital for for our ecology. So we can't we can't do without the bats. That's not even an option. Um, and and uh, again, the healthier the bats are, the happier they are, the less likely they are to shed these viruses, uh, as best we can tell. So. So it's a it's a it's a good idea to keep them happy and healthy and in intact uh, environments where they can get all the nutrition that they need. And so uh, bottom line is um, we can't do without the bats, but perhaps we can do without the bat hang up. I think that's well said. Yeah, we 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 have to coexist with the with bats um, and. They, they are happy to avoid us if they have food elsewhere. And so I, I, it's in all of our best interests to have a nice, healthy environment for bats that's separate from human settlements. Great. Well, um, Dr. Emily Curley, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Don't be afraid of bats. But if you ever have any contact with a bat, go get a rabies vaccination. <laughs> I feel like we have to say that they also carry rabies. Uh, if you have any contact with a bat here uh, in the U.S. or, or elsewhere, uh, it's good, good to get a rabies vaccine. Very good. Um, Dr. Gurley, thank you so much for joining me. Happy Halloween. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. <laughs>